Welcome back everyone to the Underground Church Channel. Today, this is the most important video you will ever see on Bible versions. I have but one question for our modern scholars today. One question indeed, guys and ladies. Do you know what it feels like to have the very blindness lifted from your eyes with the truth? With the truth. Pay very close attention. We're going to do that right now with no delay. The truth, ladies and gentlemen. So, are you guys being taught at your seminaries today that the reason why we've abandoned the majority text, majority readings in favor of the Alexandrian readings is because the Alexandrian text is earlier, therefore it's better. The theory goes like this, right? Am I correct about this? Because the earliest surviving manuscripts are Alexandrian and they have far fewer words than the later surviving Greek manuscripts of the majority text, therefore, well-meaning Christians must have added in all of those words and phrases that differ from the Alexandrian text later on. This is the theory. Here's my question. If that's true, how did the majority text readings get into the early Syrian Peshitta and the Italic version in the year 150 for the Peshitta and the year 157 for the Italic version? Did a well-meaning Christian that added those phrases and words, get in a time machine. Did he hop, go back in time into the year 150 AD before, two centuries before, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are supposedly to have been created. And back here in 150 and 157, did they add those same readings to the Syrian Peshitta and the Italic version, 150 and 157? Wait a minute now. The entire flimsy, floppy house of card foundation that we find underlying the return of the Alexandrian cult. Oh, I, did I say that? I think I just said that. That's okay. We're creating the buzz here, ladies and gentlemen. We're creating the buzz. They can shadow ban the numbers all they want. We're all watching. We're all paying attention. Even the modern scholars are paying attention to the Underground Church channel. This is the greatest video. Like I said, I did not lie to you folks. The most important video on Bible versions you will ever see in your life. Let's get back to it. How'd they get in there, folks? How did those readings get into the Syrian Peshitta and the Italic version? You see, this is what I mean. So, once this well-meaning Christian added phrases into the Greek text up here, after they had copied the unseals into minuscules, which is the reason why they then scraped off the old unseals, because writing materials and parchment were expensive at the time, and they would reuse that parchment after scraping off the unseals once they copied it over into a brand new minuscule manuscript. But in this process of simply copying things over, once he also decided to consciously add entire phrases to the Word of God, did he then hop in his time machine? Come way back here. He pops out the time machine. He's over there in Syria. The place where they were first called Christians was Antioch, not Egypt. But he goes over there to Syria, the year 150 AD. They're making the Syrian Peshitta. And he says, guys, let me talk to you. I'm going to add these specific phrases that I added in all these centuries later. I'm the man popping out of my time machine. And I'm here to tell you that we're about to fix the Bible because I'm a well-meaning Christian. And we need to fortify the doctrines. Now let's go over here to the Italic version that's being created in 157 AD. I need to add in all of these majority text readings, these traditional text readings. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen. New versions call Jesus a begotten God, which contradicts the rest of John 1 in John 1.18. Pay attention, folks. Note. I'm aware of seven manuscripts out of the 5,700 plus Greek manuscripts that say begotten God here instead of son. Six are Alexandrian. Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, P66, P75, Regius 019, and Minuscule 33. One is mixed, but still Alexandrian anyway, outside of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Ephraim Rescriptus. Therefore, here in John, all of the Greek witnesses, all of them, are Alexandrian manuscripts. Watch this, folks. This being a heretical change in John 1, obvious to most, few new versions go with it over the majority, despite usually giving priority to the Alexandrian manuscripts for sole reason that they've survived from a few centuries prior. They're earlier, therefore they're the best manuscripts. But if we can all agree that this is not the original reading, as we all agree that that is a heretical reading, which is why when they typically go with Alexandrian readings, as I just said, this time they biasly go against their method. Well, we all know that that can't be right, even though that's in all of the Alexandrian readings. So, hmm, that's a little inconsistent because that's obviously heretical. It is? If we can all agree that this is not the original reading, 
Therefore, the Alexandrians were the ones to change this, especially because these are the earliest Greek manuscripts. Can we find any readings about this? Can we find any proof that they believed this and that gave them a motive to change the text? Yes, we can, folks. Did you know that Origen wrote that Jesus was the demiurge that proceeded from the Father, just like the works of the demiurge, the creation, then proceeded from the demiurge? That means in that instance, Origen wrote that he believed that Jesus was a begotten God. Now, Origen will backtrack and cover his tracks. In other of his commentaries, he will contradict himself. You see this? He's covering his tracks because people were obviously calling him out for being a heretic. People were accusing him of even believing that Lucifer himself will be saved one day in his version of universalism. Even Lucifer will be saved. He was being accused of this, and of course, he's going to double back and he's going to say, no, no, I never said that. I never went that far and these kinds of things, right? He's like a politician over there. You got to be good at politics if you're going to be famous in the church. Folks, if you're looking at church history, oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, the scholars and pastors who got famous were also those who made political decisions to further their career along the way. They're not the ones who told you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Amen and amen. I wonder how many views this video has. Why don't you go down and check it right now? Because this is the diamond in the rough, folks. This is the gem. That's what this channel is. And I'm very proud of the fact that we don't have very many subscribers and we're not doing very well in this worldly way. Well, James, that's not really pride, is it? Maybe it's not. Well, let's get back to this, right? So that we're the underground church channel. We keep ourselves low. We don't exalt ourselves that God might have to humble us. But we're the scholars, James. Clinking my wine glass around. We're the scholars. We're the scholars over here. We're so smart. It's like, then God's going to humble you as he's doing right now with some down-to-earth underground church channel. Amen and amen and amen. Share this video, folks. Like, share, subscribe. Here we go. So even though he backtracks in other places... Origen believed that Jesus was the demiurge that proceeded from the Father, and the works of the demiurge proceeded from Jesus, the creation. Therefore, Jesus is a begotten God. Is it any wonder that when Origen puts together his Hexapola, which many scholars do believe is the source for Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, as well as some other translations, but we're going to talk about translations in a minute. Don't go away, folks. We're still on the game here. So the seven Greek manuscripts that contain this reading are all Alexandrian manuscripts. And Origen believed that Jesus was a begotten God. And yet in other places, he'll backtrack and cover his tracks by trying to make it sound like, but I also believe that Jesus was somehow there in the beginning with the Father too. Maybe they don't understand time as well. He opened himself up to doctrines of devils, of Egyptian and Greek philosophy and Gnosticism, folks. This is when Egypt corrupted the word of God. Why? Because we all agree that that is not the original reading. The Alexandrian reading in this case is clearly a heretical corrupted reading. They changed it, not the majority text, not the Christians. They did not change the majority text in this case. Watch this, folks. If we can all agree that this is not the original reading, therefore it was changed by them. Is it not likely they changed other readings that differ from the majority, given that some of the Alexandrian readings elsewhere as well are somehow miraculously closer to their heretical beliefs than the majority? I give many examples that when you give a mouse a cookie, they're going to want another one. If they got away with changing one major doctrine, which concerns the deity of Christ and his eternal existence time past, that he is a lower God, they demoted him as being a God that came after God the Father as a lower demiurge creator god, if they were not afraid to make a change, seven manuscripts out of 5,700 plus, if the Alexandrians were not afraid to make a change to the very deity of Christ and his eternal nature, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want to change other passages. But don't just take me at my word there. Let's read. Earlier manuscripts are not better if their source had a higher chance of corruption. Alexandria, Egypt. On the other hand, the contemporary theory that Christians either accidentally or with helpful intent wanted to fortify sound doctrine by adding to the scriptures anything beyond a redundant word requiring intentional thought, this theory can be refuted on two fronts. Number one, weighing intentions. Any Christian believing sound doctrine in the first place likely knows of at least one of the following passages. Revelation 22, Proverbs 30, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12, and or Jeremiah 26. 
all five of these, all of them, warn specifically against tampering with God's word by either addition or subtraction, sometimes both. The only person who thinks they're a Christian who isn't afraid of any of these is the person who does not take them literally. The consequences do not frighten him, for judgments like fire are merely symbolic and certainly not eternal. And besides, everyone goes to heaven in the end, no matter what, anyway, Origen taught many. The motive lies with the unbeliever, not the Christian. Number two, weighing accidents. Actually, while I was putting this document together and proofreading my commentary, I found a few instances where I had accidentally left out a word in the middle of a sentence. You might say, typing on a keyboard is not the same, as did I. I then proceeded to check a physical notebook I've owned for years. There were a few instances where a word was mistakenly left out slash skipped past, and zero instances of me accidentally writing the same word or phrase twice. You say, well, that would have been an intentional addition, and that's what we just addressed up here. Now, let's continue down here with this next debunking, shall we? Zero instances of me accidentally writing the same word or phrase twice, as that would have stood out and been easily caught while writing. I thought it's easier to notice something taking up space that's not supposed to be there than to spot a missing word or two. Your eyes will just glide over it, sometimes miss it. Good thing I'm not a heretic because I had just found the perfect way to get away with it. A missing word or two. That's the method by which you would change the text. It's not by adding words because then you could get caught. Okay, let's say it's the year 350 AD and you're corrupting the manuscripts because you don't believe those are the literal words of God. We need to carry over the ideas, but come on, we know the apostles were trying to get at our doctrines, like our Catholic doctrine. We're going to get to this in a second. Oh, we're going to get to this in a second. Oh, just wait. Okay. So if you want to get away with it, somebody doing something they're not supposed to do inherently knows I'm going to get caught if they just add in something new that takes up space and everybody notices, wait a second, where did that come from? That's not in all the manuscripts we're using right now. Then they're going to say, who made this manuscript? They're corrupting the words of God, these heretics. Now that person's in trouble. They're in danger. But if you remove a word or two, I mean, your eyes don't even notice it. Your eyes just glide over the passage, right? Was that supposed to be there in the first place? I don't know. See this? That's how you get away with it. And if somebody actually calls you out on it, what do you say? Oops, no. I mean, it was a mistake. It's not like, look, oops, my eyes, I'm sorry. I was getting tired and my eyes just glazed over the passage. I mean, oh man, they caught me. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me, guys. If you add something that was not there before, you know that if you're changing the passage in that way, it's easier for you to get caught. The sinner trying to do this inherently knows this. So, but by removing something, right? What do you try to do when you have sin? You try to hide it, right? Finally, folks, I'm on Team Christian. I know that the same Holy Spirit who resides in me also did in them. God has always called at least somebody, whether it was Erasmus or whoever, if not lots of people, and he put a desire in them, a calling via the Holy Spirit to preserve his words. Why? Because he said he would preserve his words. I prefer to trust my brothers and sisters in Christ and defend their ability to faithfully copy the word rather than argue they didn't do a good job and progressively corrupted the majority as time passed. The generation who thinks they know better than all of them is sure to be the generation that makes the mistake of siding against the very words they fought to keep. Back to John 1.18. King James Bible again says, Begotten Son. But check it out. In 2021, the NASB update by the Master's Seminary reintroduced Begotten God into their Legacy Standard Bible. Well, it looks like they're trying to create the next Legacy and leave the King James Bible behind, but God said no. And you need to thank God that he's showing this on the Underground Church channel with the grace of not giving this video massive amounts of views to embarrass you all for making such a ginormous mistake. 2020 NASB, God the Only Son. Well, that's not even correct, but at least it's not as bad as Begotten God. The Legacy Standard Bible took things backwards to the 1995 NASB, which said Begotten God. Wait a minute. Isn't the NASB supposed to be like the scholar's standard in English? Well, it's not exactly the legacy, neither is it the standard if it's saying begotten God in the 1995 and now the 2021 update to the NASB. How about Jude 1 1? I'm aware of four manuscripts out of 5,700 plus that say beloved in place of sanctified. So what they did was they removed perfect tense in the Greek, completed already positional sanctification from the book of Jude entirely. 
And by the way, all of these four are Alexandrian readings. Why? Why would they do such a thing? And why are we going with four manuscripts out of 5,700 plus? Alexandrians like Origen believed in universal salvation for all, whereby every person must go through a long, transformative process from flesh into eventual minds of fire over the span of even multiple reincarnated lifetimes before they can attain salvation in its fullest sense. These beliefs ally in part with the Gnostics and early Egyptian monks. Origen believed, watch this, watch this. Origen believed in justification by a faith itself composed of works. Well, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says, by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So yeah, people today try to take a variant definition. It's a possible definition, but it's not how it's used in context of the word faith. And they say, but faith itself can mean a faith that works. Uh Uh-oh. That's what Origen interprets. Faith, justification by faith, the faith itself is composed of works. Therefore, justification is conflated with a sanctifying process to reach a truly righteous state. They're not there yet. What happened to imputed righteousness? Counted righteousness, imputed righteousness. Yet, early on, you can see that when men open themselves up to demons, doctrines of devils, and they did not submit themselves humbly before what God says, they allowed their self-righteousness to get in the way. They say, God, you can't just save those people over there so easily. That's not fair because I'm trying so hard to get into heaven and that matters that I'm trying. And they don't want to try like I am. Well, you're trying to work for your salvation. You're not believing what God says. You see, folks, it's not about the fact that if somebody gets into heaven like the thief on the cross so easily, right, that that somehow diminishes God's glory. It's about the fact that God has to retain. He has to keep his words. He cannot be found a liar. How God gets glory is by abiding by what he says. So if God said in the Bible that we are not saved by our works and it is a free gift, the gift of God is eternal life. It's not the faith that will work and then eventually get you eternal life later on. No, we've been passed from death to life. We are quickened, meaning we are given life in Christ, seated in heaven already. Completed, perfect tense salvation. These guys contradict that just like Origen goes backwards on himself and they're going backwards on themselves by not doing something else rightly dividing the word of truth. Literal geniuses, the King James Bible translators were literal geniuses. You got to be kidding me. When the translating chair was fluent in over 15 languages, one guy out of all the translators of the King James Version of the Bible called by the king of three different territories, Great Britain, France, and Ireland, he had the power of a monarch to call the best, tell them to drop what they're doing for years and full-time work on a translation of the Bible. And you mean to tell me that The buddy boys of the Calvinist New Version Club are getting together and doing a better translation and correcting the King James translators? You've got to be kidding me. No, each part of the translation by the time it was finished was looked at well over 10 times. That means that when you look at verses like rightly dividing the word of truth, a genius took a look at that. So did another genius. So did another smart guy. And if they thought, wait a second, shouldn't we translate Orthodomalta as just generically handling the Bible? No. There's a reason why they translated it as rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus himself was a dispensationalist who picked up and rightly divided the word. He picked up Isaiah chapter 61 and he divided it in half in the middle of a sentence before the sentence was even done. And he dispensationalized one half to his time period and one half to the second coming of Christ way out here 2,000 years later in the future. Now, essentially, folks, the apostles were also dispensationalists who took a literal interpretation of prophecy, not a figurative allegorical interpretation. Right? They went back into the Old Testament and they exacto knifed out portions to apply to a fulfillment of that prophecy in the first coming of Christ, sometimes in those very same passages, there are unfulfilled prophecies that will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why we have to use a consistent hermeneutic that if he fulfilled the first half in that same passage before sometimes the sentence is even done, literally, how do you think the rest of that same sentence is going to play out? consistent hermeneutic. We interpret it like the apostles themselves did. The second half is interpreted plainly and literally. That's why we're dispensational. And that's why we interpret prophecy literally. And that's why we keep calling the shots and getting it right. When dispensationalists at the turn of the century into the 1900s were predicting 
that now comes the apostasy and then 1900 on the dot, the New Testament English version of the American Standard Version, which is the corrupted Alexandrian version, enters the United States on the dot, as well as they're predicting, the dispensationalists predicted well before it happened, that Israel had to return as an official nation recognized by the world as it is now, right? They're predicting these things because they knew they had the proper hermeneutic of how to interpret scripture based on how the apostles handled scripture, based on how Jesus Christ, God in the flesh himself, they also changed that in the new versions. They said he was manifest in flesh. No, it's God was manifest in the flesh. They're trying to demote the deity of Christ, changing the words of God, thinking that God doesn't care when God said he exalts his word above his own name. Oh, they also changed that in the new versions. It doesn't say he exalts his word above his own name. They changed it in the new versions too. Look at all these things. Every word of God is pure. Well, we can't take that literally. Okay, origin. Well, you can make your new version and you're going to make a paraphrase. Oh, you're going to make a little bit of a dynamic. You're going to bring it over in a dynamic way. And you're going to say, well, we don't need to keep every single word. Let's just get the idea. As if origin and the boys over there were not thinking the exact same thing. In fact, we have a quotation from origin whereby he says, the scriptures are of little use for those who already know them, who already like read them. Okay, come on. We don't need those anymore. We got the philosophies. Let's start the first catechetical school of Alexandria, Egypt. Let's start it, guys. We need these catechetical teachings. We're not going to teach directly from the Word of God. No, we're going to teach these catechetical teachings. Because once you've read the Bible once, you get the idea. You get the idea, says Origen. How very unfortunate indeed the Laodicean age of the church is. Look at this. Eight manuscripts out of the 5,700 plus that omit this. Five manuscripts out of the 5,700 plus Greek manuscripts that omit this. And most of these affect doctrine, if not something still very important. That's why I included them in this document. I'm aware of three manuscripts out of the 5,700 plus Greek manuscripts that omit without a cause here. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Guess what? This is returning to the 1582 Catholic version that just simply says, I say to you that whoever is angry, whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Well, Jesus, I guess you're in danger of the judgment. Yeah, I'm sure that was the original reading and that was not done by somebody, whether it was an Alexandrian or somebody using an Alexandrian manuscript that was hidden over there in the Vatican or someplace. I'm sure we can't connect the dots by using intuitive intelligence or fluid IQ or anything of the sort, right? Can't be, can't be. Four manuscripts out of 5,700 plus. I've included all my commentary in here as well, guys, and you're definitely going to want to take a look at this. This will change your life. I'm not being a salesman here. It can also change your eternal destination if you're following some kind of a confusing faith plus works salvation program. New versions replace rapture context with works salvation. Once again, folks, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. Where are those things located? The grass and the flower. On the earth, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But, so by contrast to those things that fade, the word of our God shall stand forever. God preserves his words. Where are they? Are they scattered, unknown, not in use? The sword, the blade of the sword is scattered. So nobody can use the sword then. God says, take up the sword, which is the word of God. That's our only offensive weapon is the word of God from your armament. But now let's get into the nitty gritty. Are we ready, folks, for the history of the manuscripts? Many scholars believe that the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were two of the 50 copies of the Bible which were made in Greek by command of Emperor Constantine about the year 331. Now, this is even being brought into question, but you know what? Let's give him the benefit of the doubt and let's see if this works. Under the supervision of Bishop Eusebius, the historian of Caesarea, these Bibles were prepared in great haste, which could explain the frequent omission of words and phrases. Folks, the absolute amateur abilities of the scribes. Eusebius was an admirer of Origen. Eusebius and Origen held to an unbiblical system of belief known as Gnosticism. Origen was a philosopher in Alexandria, Egypt, who said that the scriptures are of little use to those who understand them as they are written, and was infatuated with Greek philosophy and Plato. In fact, that's how he interpreted the Pauline epistles for the bodily resurrection, was by using Plato's Phaedrus, which is just some fictional philosophical nonsense that somebody thought about in their own head. Oh, maybe that's how we should understand the Pauline epistles and a bodily resurrection. Arianism, which teaches that Christ was not divine, was prevalent in Alexandria. Was it? Could that have influenced how Origen demoted the deity of Christ? Of course not, James. All of these things are pure speculation. It's like all of these things are something that you are ignoring. That's the real problem here. All of these things are something that you are all ignoring. True analysts know that they're still here, but they just don't carry absolute weight. But 
It's the combination of all of them that increases the weight. When you add them all on top of the scale, that's why we give it more precedence. It was during an upsurge of Arianism in Rome that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are believed to have been produced, which is really funny. That's really funny because later on, the Roman Empire of the Catholic Church was going around persecuting people for being Arians. And yet, there is a strong weighted possibility that when they're taking the Alexandrian manuscripts, they contain influence from Arianism. Oops. Now look, the received text is untainted with Egyptian philosophy and unbelief. Wow, unbelief. You're trusting those guys to handle your manuscripts. If you have two groups of people, one are believers and one are atheists, who are you going to trust to handle your manuscripts? Well, these guys did it 50 years earlier than these guys, so I'm going to trust them because they did it 50 years earlier. Well, that goes out the window now because of the Peshitta and the Italic translation. The received text is untainted with Egyptian philosophy and unbelief and strongly upholds the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. Yeah, but those guys added those words in. Weakest argument ever. The divinity of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth. Yes, in the book of Luke, the Alexandrian texts call Joseph the father of Jesus rather than God the father. They call him the father of Jesus. Not in the traditional text. It says Joseph and his mother. The Alexandrian texts generally minimize the virgin birth of Christ, the deity of Christ, the infallibility of the Bible, the doctrine of salvation by faith, yes, and the Trinity. This is in harmony with the Egyptian philosophy that influences their originators. Well, James, it might be in harmony with what they believed, but that doesn't prove that they were the ones who changed it. It's like we have proof that they were the ones who made Jesus into a begotten God in the Alexandrian text. Those are in the Alexandrian Greek manuscripts. We all don't believe that. They did change that. You give a mouse a cookie, you think they stopped at just eating one. That's ridiculous. Blinding ourselves to truths. No, you can't prove anything. It's like we stack up the evidence. We don't ignore the evidence. That's an amateur way of doing analysis. I have to be tough on these guys, ladies and gentlemen. It's time, okay? An amateur way of doing analysis is I'm going to ignore that because it doesn't support my argument. I'm going to ignore that too. That doesn't support me. I'm going to ignore that. It's like, no, you put them all on the scales right? Sure. At the beginning, it doesn't seem like one piece of data carries that much weight, but you put it on the scale. You stack them up. Now you look at the overall evidence and you see, well, how do all of these dots properly connect, right? That is true analysis if you actually want to figure out what was going on. Which groups of Christians held to the received text and Alexandrian text in the past? This is important. From the 150s, the voudois of the French Alps passed the old Latin Bible called Common Bible or Vulgate. This is the old Latin Vulgate. That's not the same thing as the Vulgate that was produced by Jerome later on. Okay. So I've talked about this, right? Jerome was warning Augustine. He said, talking about the Septuagint, because the copies available at the time were made by Origen, right? That those were corrupted. The ones that Origen got for his copy of the Septuagint so this is really funny. Jerome was telling Augustine not to trust Origenian manuscripts, his copy of the Septuagint. And yet, even though Jerome did not mess up as much as Augustine with the Alexandrian authorities, essentially Jerome still used them for his version of the Latin Vulgate, which goes into the Roman Catholic Church. Uh-oh. In fact, some people believe that he was using Vaticanus as the underlying authority for the Latin Vulgate used by the Catholic Church. But from the 150s, the voudois of the French Alps passed the old Latin Bible called Common Bible or Vulgate throughout Europe and the British Isles. The voudois people were regarded by the Protestants and Baptists as pre-reformers, passing down the gospel message till the Reformation of the 1500s. Their Bibles, as well as others translated from them, were so accurate they were included in translating the King James Bible. This could be a reason why the King James Bible is actually a little bit closer to the majority text than the TR is to the majority text. But we still put them all into the same family as the majority text because of the huge difference between them and the Alexandrian text. When Erasmus, many considered to be the smartest man alive at the time, when Erasmus made decisions on what to include in the Textus Receptus, he was still drawing from his authorities from the majority text. Okay, But he made decisions on what to include in the Textus Receptus. Is it any doubt that the man was being led by God? You can't ignore the fact that God is always there and he has to keep his promise that he's going to preserve his word. So you think that God's going to use this smart guy and maybe do something with him. No, it couldn't have been James. He made all these mistakes and the word of God has been lost. Okay. The old Latin Vulgate of the Voudois is of the received text type and is not the same as the later Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate. 
the Peshitta, about 150 AD. This Bible generally follows the received text. The received text has been translated into English, German, Dutch, and other languages. During the Dark Ages, the received text was practically unknown outside the Greek church. Remember, there was also a split within the Roman Catholic Church in 1054 AD, where the Greek church did not recognize the papacy. Now watch this. The received text became the Bible of the Syrian church, of the Waldensian church of northern Italy, of the Gallic church in southern France, and of the Celtic church in Scotland and Ireland, as well as the official Bible of the Greek Catholic church. All these churches were in opposition to the church of Rome. They, as represented in their descendants, are rivals to this day. They're rivals to this day of Rome. Well, is it any wonder? That's another topic for another day. Now, many Bible fragments from the 2nd century AD are being found and contain many of the readings of the received text. This shows that the received text existed as early as the 2nd century and that the argument of modern scholars about the late origin of the received text has no basis. However, the evidence from these early manuscripts is not mentioned in classes taught by these scholars. No basis. Every time you open up a new version and you read, these are the earliest, no, and best, definitely no. These manuscripts have so many edits, changes, omissions, they don't even agree with each other. The Alexandrian text line doesn't even agree well with each other. But remember, while these guys can find exceptions to this and they try to use it, but they're not doing the math properly, they're not comparing them properly. You can find far more Byzantine type texts that align almost perfectly with each other than you can among the Alexandrian texts. But what these guys will do, because they're being biased, they're going over to the Byzantine text and because there's so many of them, sure, they can find a couple here and there where the alignment is not very good, right? Oh, see? So it's over here too. So that means that the Alexandrian, I mean, come on, both of them have problems in alignment. It's like, are you kidding me? Okay, we've got close to 4,000 that have a stronger alignment than the Alexandrian text. And among those, you can certainly find almost perfect alignment. If God preserved his words, it's definitely not in the Alexandrian text because of the differences. If it is, you tell me which one. Is it Vaticanus? Is that the one where he preserved it? Or is it Sinaiticus? And if it's a mixture of the two, how can anybody know what the mixture is that is the original reading? If it's some of Sinaiticus and some of Vaticanus, then where's the original reading? Nobody knows. Therefore, the only people who are siding with those as their authority are the people who literally do not believe that God preserved his word. It's simple when you do the math and you do the deductions, folks. Now, it's no wonder that the King James translators, the geniuses, that Erasmus, who inquired about Vaticanus, but he did not use it, right? Is it any wonder why these very intelligent men did not use the Alexandrian manuscripts, period? Is it any wonder, folks? And yet, we think we're so much smarter out here in the 20th and 21st centuries. Folks, let me explain how silly that is by continuing to read this, right? There are numerous lectionaries which are books used for early church worship. These books contain Bible verses and heavily favor the readings of the received text. This indicates that the TR readings were the ones accepted and used in popular worship. The early church fathers were prominent Christians from the first centuries after Christ whose writings have been preserved. So this guy believes in preservation. Therefore, God is going to spiritually open his mind up to be able to see the truth with clarity. The people who don't believe what God said, God can give you over to a delusion. That's why they can't see these obvious things, right? They frequently quote the Bible in their writings. By looking at these quotations, we can determine which version of the Bible manuscripts they use. The received text agrees with the vast majority of the 86 thousand plus citations from scripture by the early church fathers up to 400 AD. This shows that the received text was in existence. Wait, I thought that where it differs from the Alexandrian text, since that's supposed to be the original readings, that all of those additional phrases and words were added in later on by well-meaning Christians. But it seems like they existed back then, which means that the Alexandrian readings are not the earliest readings. Meaning what? Now scholarship is forced to make a decision not based on age, but we're forced to make a decision based on reputation and association, which is the very thing they've been avoiding this entire time. For example, when quoting Revelation 22.14, the church fathers Tertullian, Cyprian, and Tertonius, quote, do his commandments and not wash their robes as found in the Alexandrian text. The first time wash their robes is quoted is by Athanasius, bishop of Alexandria, in the mid 300 ADs. So the received text reading predates even the earliest manuscripts in existence. But that's not all. 
Helvidius, a Christian scholar from northern Italy in the 4th century, accused Jerome of using corrupt manuscripts and compiling a Latin Bible for use by the Roman Catholic Church. Obviously, Helvidius had a greater knowledge of the available Bible manuscripts than we do and felt that the Alexandrian manuscripts used by Jerome were inferior. Thus, the controversy over Bible versions has continued for over 1,500 years. Now, folks, this is important to understand. Think back to when you were in high school or college. Remember what was cool that you and your friend group were all keenly aware of. And what did you all think? Man, these other people don't get it. The people younger than us don't get it. The people older than us don't get it. But they're keenly aware of the situation. They're keenly aware of the culture. And, and what's the buzz? What's the latest news happening? What do we know about this? So you think that maybe if you were a Christian living at the times when these manuscripts were actually going around and in use, that you might have known better. And the further away, especially if today, why would we, how much more are we out of touch with the arguments that they were all aware of, of why they were choosing which manuscripts to go with at the time, folks? And yet in our arrogance, what are we doing? We're like, we know better than all of them. We're better now. We're better now. It's like, no, we're Laodicea. <laughs> Come on, this is silliness. It's like, we're Laodicea. We're not better now. We're far removed from the context, and we don't know what was hip during the conversations of the King James translators and all these guys. We don't know. We have to trust that God was anointing and using men and making the right decisions to preserve his word across time. So where is it? No, it was lost. I don't know. How can anybody know that? It's like, well, it doesn't sound like you're coming from a position of faith. But we are, meaning God is probably going to be on our side with this. Thus, the controversy over Bible versions has continued for over 1,500 years. So let's look at the big picture and not lose the forest for the trees. You have Egypt and the Roman Catholic Church, and then you have those using the majority text, or as we call it, the traditional text, going all the way back to the time of the earliest church. In contrast, the newer Latin Vulgate by Jerome has been the recognized Bible of Catholics for centuries. The reason given by the Catholic Church for burning so many Bibles in the Middle Ages was that they were not the Roman Catholic version. For example, in 1490, Torquemada caused many Hebrew Bibles and more than 6,000 volumes to be burnt in auto de fe at Salamanca. Okay, and so isn't that funny? They caused the Hebrew Bibles to be burned. It's like, folks, that's the original language that the Old Testament was written in. And he says, no, look, what did Augustine say? The, the, what did Augustine say? The Greek Septuagint supersedes the Hebrew that the original, the Hebrew. And on top of that, we now have the Latin that was produced and given to us by Jerome. Oh man, what a disaster. In view of this and many similar incidents, it is a marvel that so many copies of the received text have survived to the present day. That's because people love the word of God. They're being persecuted to the death in order to hold on to the true line of text, the words of God. This is your host and analyst and the founder of Complete Dispensationalism, James of the Underground Church Channel. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe.